Uh, good evening, everybody. I want to say thank you for joining us today. My name is Rob Johnson. I'm on the Seattle City Council. Happy to chair the Planning Land Use and Zoning Committee, but I'm also very interested in public transit and transportation issues uh, come out of this community. And I'm really excited to have you all join us here tonight as we hear from a nationally recognized leader on innovation and what we can do to do a better job of integrating all the different modes of transportation that we've got as a, as a city. Um, John Luca, who's going to be the, the, the presenter tonight, has a really interesting and diverse background. Uh, not only has, is he currently serving as the Advocacy and Communications Director for a nonprofit uh, foundation out of New York called Transit Center, uh, but he also has spent a lot of time on the, the public sector side before that, working for the New York City DOT and then also um, for transit, transportation alternatives and the other one, the Tri Street Transportation Campaign. And both organizations that are really rooted in advocacy. Um, and when he went from the advocacy community to the New York City DOT, uh, was called, and I think this is an accurate quote, perhaps more important than even Commissioner Sadiq Khan in the work that he did um, when he was in New York City DOT. So we're really lucky to have him here with us tonight. I just wanted to kick off the conversation about why we think this is so important here at City Hall, at least why I think it's so important. You know, we're in the uh, middle of a, a lot of inspiring innovations that are happening around the country. When you look at uh, bike share, like City Bike, and what we've tried to do here with our Pronto system, when you look at the ways that we've been able to activate public spaces through play streets, through uh, taking back our streets to make them safer, just the movement that we've seen here in the city with the Greenways uh, progress, as well as the great leadership of nonprofits like Cascade Bicycle Club to fight for more protected bike lanes. We're at this incredible inflection point where I think people are really interested in building a bigger movement about how we can create safer streets for all people and all of us here in the city. And that's critically important to connect with the infrastructure investments that we're making right now. When you look at the first year of implementation of the Move Seattle levy, when you look at the work that we're doing around expanding our bus service network, um, when you look at the light rail construction plan that we have, as well as knock on wood, more to come, we've got a really great opportunity to reshape that 27% of the city's land mass that is our roadway network into a place that is actually safe for people, not just for cars. And I think we can make it safer for cars too, don't get me wrong, but I'm really focused on what we can do to make it safer for those of us who are walking, biking, and taking transit every day, because that's a big impediment to what we see as our overarching larger goals. When you look at the city's climate goals, carbon neutrality has got to be one of the things that we focus on here as a city, and the best way for us to, re to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions is to get people out of their cars. This region has seen a, a larger share of transit increase over the last decade than any other region in the country. But we also know that as people move here, when they move here, they're more susceptible to changing their modes of behavior. So as we can capture all those new folks that are moving here and get them thinking differently, get them into public transit, get them onto bikes, get them walking, we not only are, are creating a better and healthier climate, we're also creating better and healthier people. Um, it's a great triple bottom line for us. That also has, uh, obviously, economic benefits. From every study that I've seen for uh, businesses that are trying to locate here, their recruitment and retention policies have a lot to do with great public transportation, great bicycling networks, great safe streets for people. So that's the new generation workforce priority. And we've got to make sure that we're recognizing that and meeting folks where they are with smarter policy goals and, and better infrastructure investments here as a city. So uh, I'll stop, get off my, uh, my stuff and stop this whole thing and, and move on over to John, who's the real star for today. But I just wanted to say a quick thank you to a couple of folks. Cascade Bicycle Club, Community Seattle, Future Wise, Seattle Bike Blog, Seattle Neighborhood Greenway, Seattle Transit Blog, Transportation Choices, and The Urban has all sponsored tonight's uh, presentation. So we're really grateful to all those great nonprofits that do wonderful work here in the city. We are being recorded for posterity, so be aware of that when you ask John or all your difficult questions, that that's going to be made famous all throughout the blogosphere and the universe. Um, and I just think that today's presentation, talking about the bike and transit integration in urban areas, and particularly downtowns, is critical for us. I was just in a meeting with the mayor today, and he was telling me that we are having more construction in downtown Seattle than we've ever had in the uh, city's history. That's an incredible statistic for us. And I know for me as a pedestrian, as a transit rider, as an as a occasional bike rider downtown, I feel that construction. We're closing sidewalks. We're not making it convenient for people. We're building out infrastructure 
uh, in the city right now that I think is, is really critical, but it's also important for us to be thinking about not only the future, but the uh, users of today, too. So I think that's, that's really uh, uh, all my way of saying, I look forward to all the great information and news that you, and ideas that you share with us, John. I've got uh, two kids at home with 104 degree temperature, so I'm going to go handle my family business. But if you have questions or comments or things that we should be focused on here from the city, Emilio Garza from my office is here. He's taking a bow right now. He'd be happy to chat with you. Sorry that I can't stay for some time, but you're in great hands. Thank you for coming. Great. Well, thanks so much, Council Member, for kicking us off. And um, thanks to all of you for ducking out of work a few minutes early tonight to, to be here. And, and thanks to all the uh, host groups for having me. Um, I want to talk about sort of where we've come with the uh, cycling networks in New York and, and to talk a little bit about the practical implications of, of what we've been able to do over the last about seven or eight years and also some of the political. Um, can you guys see this already? Is there too much light on the screen? Okay. Um, talk a little bit about the politics of doing it and, and some of the some of the politics of, of not just getting it done, but um, you know how you sort of carry forward through through controversy. And, uh, you know some of the things that, that we all experience when we're talking about change, in particular changing streets in, in front of uh, people's eyes. Um, and, and, and as Rob said, I, I, my career in, in transportation came through advocacy. So, you know, coming to forums like this and, and meeting with people who are, you know, active in changing their city and, and, and making it a better place is really the most fun thing for me to do. And, you know, it was, it was a pretty remarkable opportunity to be able to go into city government and work in a policy environment where the mayor said, we are going to make cycling a real uh, option for people to get around. And, he put a, a transportation commissioner into office who took that very seriously and wasn't just, uh, you know, going to put plans on a shelf or, or put words on a page. We were actually going to go out and figure out how to do it. And, and you know, we didn't, we didn't have a real script for it. And, but we knew more or less what it would take. And, you know, we did, we did a lot of sort of contemporary studying of what other cities were doing in terms of bringing the cycling from, you know, a, a pretty low or scary point to something that was an option for many, many more people. So, you know, we've, we've, we've come a long way. New York was, you know, a, a really tough place for cyclists in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, even with a few exception, exceptional pieces of infrastructure that were put in in the later 90s and, and after 2000, still, still pretty tough. And, and it's certainly a work in progress. It's not, you know, uh, you know a bike friendly city from edge to edge by any means. But it is, it is, Really in progress, it is. It, you know, things are changing, and many, many, many more people are riding bikes just to get around. Um, and it's in a context that's very, pretty similar. And you know, and, and the achievement's been been recognized and acknowledged, and that's that's been been great. This is a piece in Bicycling Magazine in 2014, and we used to rank. So we they used to put the top ten, and then the worst three. And New York was always in, in the worst three until you know, sometime. They were probably always in the worst way until they put us at number one. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, we really sort of were looking at places that, that um, were trying to change. And if you had ever been to, say, Paris in the, in the 1990s, you wouldn't even thought about trying to ride a bike there. But they elected a mayor uh, in the early 2000s, and he started remaking the streets. Uh, and, you know, and then offered not a whole lot of people to ride riding bikes. And then, he created a, a huge public bike share system on top of that, and it became the talk of the city, and, and it really changed things quickly. So we were looking at what are some of the really important elements, and you know, one of the biggest complaints that cyclists had in New York for years and years was the city would create a bike lane kind of grudgingly, because they were getting beat up by the advocates. There was a demonstrable safety problem, you know, that really just couldn't be ignored. But the bike lane would then just stop and drop you off into heavy traffic, you know, on some other streets. And so one of the things we really wanted to do was think about getting people from A to B uh, in, in a real bike network. And of course, painted bike lanes on the street are okay for some people, um, and a few people will just ride through anything. But people really want to feel 
safer. And it's pretty obvious when you look at the places that just have mass amounts of cycling for, for getting around that that's what does it, is creating real safe feeling space for people away from cars. And so we wanted to figure out how, how would you do that quickly in an American city. And we watched Vélib in Paris. We watched the Barclay systems unfolding in London. And you don't see a lot of bike sharing systems in places like Holland and Denmark and Germany because what it really is is a way to accelerate the process of sort of bicyclization, bicycle transportation. Um, putting a ton of bikes in public and inviting people to use them, um, not something you need to do in Denmark because you already have mass bicyclization. But it can really help in some settings. And so I think it's important to think about that context uh, for, for what you do with bike share. And I think that's not very well appreciated in a lot of places that are looking at bike share, thinking about bike share. So I want to really focus on the bike network. So this is the situation we found right before we got into um, sort of office in, at New York City DOT in, in the middle of 2007. As I said, the city had paid some homage to Stephanie and done a few bike lanes here and there. As I said, very much under pressure from advocates. Some of it is from pre-World War II, uh, parkway paths and things like that. Some of it was from different sort of bursts uh, of interest in cycling, in, in, especially in the 1980s. Uh, and then some of it was just sort of gradually starting to build up. In 2013, when Mayor Bloomberg left office, it looked more like this. Um, and the mayor's sustainability policy, which was articulated sort of halfway through his 12 years in 2007, called for 200 miles of new bike lanes within uh, a few fiscal years. And so we did the 200, and then we built upon that at a pace of maybe 40 to 50 uh, miles a year after that. But one thing I think is important to notice, it wasn't spread evenly throughout the city. There was a really big focus in here, probably the lower third of Manhattan and Brooklyn North of Prospect Park. And that wasn't by accident. I mean, we did bike lanes in, in a variety of places, and you can see some smaller networks emerging in different parts of town. But we really, really drove it hard in, in a couple of interconnected areas. And the reason we did that was because we knew this was going to be a battle. We knew people were going to, uh, you know, naysay it. We knew we'd have all kinds of, you know, issues with the tabloid press. And so we wanted to be able to show results. So we put the most bike lanes into areas where people were already using bikes. Because we knew they were demographically inclined, they were, you know, the distances they were going allowed them to use bikes to get around. And so we put the most bike lanes in the already most bike friendly parts of the city. That sound, may sound counterintuitive, but the thing, the thing when, you're, when you're changing things, when you're, you know, getting out on a policy limb, you really need to succeed. You need to win. And nothing beats success like success. Whereas if you had tried this in the Northern Bronx or Eastern Queens, and built a big network there where nobody was riding bikes, you probably would get some more cyclists, but you would not get the kind of blast of numbers that we, that we wanted to see to really say, look, this works. New Yorkers are not like some kind of group of humans apart. They also respond when we build a bike network, and they get on their bikes and they ride. So that was the idea, was to, to really build a good network in, in one or two parts of town or close to each other, um, where we knew people were already riding bikes. And we knew that mainly because the bridges that connect those parts of Manhattan and Brooklyn have good bike paths on them. And we were, you know, and those were places where cyclists were counted. So you could really see that, uh, you know, that there were a lot of cyclists there, that it was growing over time, and that there was potential in that area. And a lot of us live in that area, so we also know it, and we've been, we've been watching it for years. So there was a real decision about how to try to succeed with this by making some really bike-friendly districts. Um, <clears throat> and within a short period of time, this is not protected bike lanes at all. This is 2007 before we had sort of come up with a template for protected bike lane. You started to see scenes like this as the painted bike lanes interconnected with each other and got you know started getting it to a point where if you're just a few blocks away from a bike lane that would lead you to other bike lanes, that could lead you to the bridges, and could lead you to the bike network in Manhattan, and get you, get, you know, get not everybody, but a lot more people uh, from AB uh, on a bike in, in the kinds of trips and, and the, 
you know, the, the basic routines of their lives could be carried out much more easily by a bike. And so we're seeing these kinds of scenes in Brooklyn neighborhoods as people start to use the network, filing up at red lights. And again, it's not, it's not protected bike lanes that are doing that. It's just paint, painted lanes on the street. Um, but the protected bike lanes help to accelerate that as we went. And one of the interesting things that I learned from the guys who were planning, doing the, you know, the real nuts and bolts of planning this, is that they, they kept track of it. And in fact, Jeanette writes them and said, look, I'm tired of these bike lanes that leave me out in heavy traffic. I want you to start connecting these things in a conscious way, and I want you to measure it somehow. So this, this is a, from a, a document called the Mayor's Management Report. And we made the Bicycle Connectivity Index one of the things that was reported every year in that report. So that it wasn't just miles of lanes that you know, didn't add up to anything. We were actually documenting that um, there were much, many, many more trips from A to B that you could make, you know, staying more or less within the bike network. So how did that work? I'm not going to go into the, the, the real technical details of it. It's actually pretty simple. It, it ranks every intersection in the city that has a bike lane in it. And it ranks each of those intersections on, on a score of how many times you can actually turn when you come into that intersection on a bike and stay in the network. So the top example, all those intersections score zero because you're, you're riding along Grand Street, but you have no option to turn and stay on the bike network. And then you have a bunch of one-way bike lanes crossing each other in another part of Brooklyn. And you start to get better scores there. You have some options to turn as you come into those intersections and stay in the bike network. And then in, in the lower example, you're in uh, the lower east side of Manhattan, and you're starting to connect into a two-way protected bike path. And that connectivity starts to really mount up in those intersections because you start to have all kinds of options for turning. And so this was tracked in the traffic department year over year. What are the scores? As we add bike lanes, maybe we put six miles of bike lanes into Eastern Queens and it didn't connect to anything. So it didn't add to the connectivity index. But maybe we infilled some stuff in some of these other areas where we already had bike lanes. And then the connectivity starts to mount up. And it was never done, but you could actually take different parts of the city and analyze it using these metrics to say, well, we have tremendous connectivity in the lower side of Manhattan, but we have you know, terrible connectivity in the center of the Bronx because all the bike lanes there are north south, and we haven't yet figured out the east-west corridors. So you can get up and down the Bronx, but you're not connecting to very much, or the network is very complete. Um, and I'm trying to get the advocates sort of schooled in this so they can start doing these analyses themselves. People for Bikes, the, uh, the national group in Colorado, is also working on some ideas about this so we can start comparing cities across some kind of connectivity network, uh, sorry, metric, and, and really think about you know, who's, who's building a network that's usable by people. What's a, what's a smart piece of transportation infrastructure? Uh, we have a bunch of cities that have some pilot you know, protected bike lanes, but what, is it, what do they actually lead you to? What do they add up to in the long run? And in, and in the sort of vast marketplace of travel decisions that people are making in our cities, um, you know, do you have enough people close enough to these things or being led from one to the next where it really makes, makes transportation sense for them? So really, at, you know, by 2013, we were looking at a situation in this part of, of lower Manhattan and, and northern Brooklyn that I highlighted where you where very few people live more than a few blocks from a bike lane that would lead them to other bike lanes. And in this version of the city's bike map, the green parts are separated paths or protected bike lanes. And those really started to add up. You can see there's a, a spine of protected bike lanes on the east side of Manhattan. There's a bike path on the west side. And there's an emerging set of paths of protected lanes on the Brooklyn waterfront which were leading you know, people more and more into the rest of this uh, existing and emerging network so that um, you know, we were really getting tremendous uptake. The protected bike lanes would convince somebody who wasn't running you know, to try it, and then they saw it wasn't so bad, and it could be done, and it, it got you to the bridge OK, and then you know, from there, and, you know, we had situations like Hurricane Sandy where the subways were knocked out for a few days, and, People said, well, I know my neighbor rides to work, so and I got, I, you know, I'm not going to sit home for, for four days while they restore the electricity. So, uh, you know, we just, and we actually, we, we had all kinds of excess staff while, while, you know, our office buildings were knocked out, so we sent them out to count. And, you know, we saw tremendous um, 
uh, volume spikes in some of these places with, with bike traffic when the subways are out. And, you know, just more and more people become aware of when you can see the infrastructure um, being this visible. And then not coincidentally, in that very same area at the, in, in the spring of 2013, we put a huge bike share system down right on top of it, and that really helped to, again, fill the lanes. The, the protected bike lanes had a tremendous impact on people's ability to just get on the bike share and try it. So it was, again, it was a very, very focused effort in terms of the geography of where we did this, so that we were really generating great numbers in terms of cycling. And this, this is kind of the, um, the story in a nutshell. The, uh, the green line, sort of snaking through the middle, is the mileage of the bike network total, bike paths and bike lanes on the streets. The, uh, the blue line, shooting way up, starting in 2007, is, the, is a, an index of, of bicycle counts that the city has taken going back to the 1980s. And I don't have it updated, but it goes up a uh, little, little, about the same sequence in 2014. It, it moderated a little bit last year, but. Um, you can see the ridership, you know, really responded to the increase in, in bike lane mileage. But what I always found the most interesting is if you tracked the connectivity index on top of this, the two steepest curves in here were, as this network, uh, as that network in, in Upper Brooklyn, Lower Manhattan started connecting, started really being knit together, that's when we saw tremendous ridership take off. Um, you know, complete coincidence here between the, the greatest increase in connectivity and the fastest uh, percentage growth in, in cycling in the city, at least as far as we were counting. Um, so I think it's really fascinating, and I think you know it's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about where you're going to put your resources in cycling. But we'll do. I'll try to get through all this. So we can do questions and stuff. Um, I don't want to sit up here drawing, drawing all day, and, and, and you know we're moving, moving pretty well. I want to mention a couple other ideas about connectivity to you that I noticed recently. Um, since I left the city, I've been helping the advocacy groups that I used to work at again. And uh, in, in 2015, I helped transportation alternatives with some ideas for a campaign to get a protected bike lane on 6th Avenue in Manhattan. This is a slightly updated design map. So the green, the green are still the protected bike lanes and the separated paths. The blue are the painted bike lanes. And the purple is like shadows on the street. So what was interesting? TA was under pressure from its membership to get a protected bike lane on 6th Avenue, which is here. And there was a painted lane there forever since the 1980s. Some of it was actually taken out. It actually cuts out altogether above 42nd Street. Uh, and they also had people wanting a bike lane on 5th Avenue, which is here. There's a painted lane south of 23rd Street, nothing all the way from the rest of uptown, and it comes downtown. Um, and so I said, well, look, let's go, just, let's, I, I stood out there and watched and looked at what's going on on 6th Avenue, and amazingly, there's a ton of cyclists on 6th Avenue, and they're like, yeah, that's who's demanding this improvement. And I was kind of, you know, impressed by that, because if you look, there's, there are really good protected bike lanes on 8th and 9th Avenues, and they go the entire distance through Midtown and down into the village. And if you're on the east side, there's a great, great protected bike lane on 1st Avenue that goes all the way uptown, way off this map, and a, a decent part of 2nd Avenue, but not all of it. And I was like, why are these people riding on 6th? And on Broadway, there's also a downtown one-way protected bike lane. So I was like, why are they riding on 6th? But they were. It didn't matter why they were. And we went out and counted them as part of this campaign, which, which is successful. The city will be implementing uh, protected bike lanes on part of 6th Avenue here this summer. And we found that bikes were 10% uh, of the vehicles in motion on these two avenues, almost 10% on 6th Avenue. And I was really impressed by this. So it really shows that you can build a protected bike lane on one side of town and another on another side of town, but it doesn't go where people really want to go. They, they're using bikes to get to where they need to be. Um, they're going to they're going to ride on those streets anyway, at least if there's already a network getting them out on their bikes. About 25% of these people were on city bikes, so this isn't all just delivery guys and messengers. There's a, there, there was a lot of people just getting around on bikes on these avenues. So I thought it was fascinating that they weren't going, they weren't going to go a block or two out of their way to use protected bike lanes. They're going where they want to go, and 
you know, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty tough street to bike on. So, you know, I think, you know, this really helped to make the case to the city that um, it was time to, 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 to pull the trigger and, and do that. So as I said, they're only going to do it on part of 6th Avenue this year, which sets up pressure for them to do more of 6th Avenue, you know, subsequent construction season. And that's, that's one of the other things that we kind of figured out as we were doing this. I mean, places like Copenhagen and Amsterdam weren't built in a day. You can't do it all at once. And all the stuff I've been showing you took, you know, six or seven years to get on the street. So one of the things that, um, that you know, the, the, the traffic guys started to show me was, well, look, we can only do so much this year, but if we set up some obvious gaps, we can really set up some external pressure for us to finish it, even if those are really in some really hard places. So they were able to do, they had a lot of pressure from the residential area of Manhattan, the Upper West Side, to get safer cycling uh, infrastructure in. So protected bike lanes developed in two phases on Columbus Avenue, probably started around 2010, 2010 to 2009, and got it there. And we had already built a protected bike lane on 9th Avenue in Midtown. So there's this stupid gap of about 20 blocks. It's, it's a very tough gap. Lincoln Center is here. People pull up in windows or whatever. The people who live around here are pain in the ass in general. <laughs> and, and, but if you have a protected bike lane here and one's leading to it here 20 blocks away, the, the pressure does become irresistible to link it up. And you, you know, you can go into the mayor's office and say, look, I mean, it's obvious we should do this. Um, and it's also obvious that we only have people riding downtown in protected infrastructure on Columbus Avenue and no way to get back. Uh, so this year there is, uh, actually just a few weeks ago, the implementation of protected bike lane on Amsterdam Avenue um, started. So that's, that's actually a project that's under, under construction right now. Um, but so it's, you know, the network doesn't present itself, you know, fully, fully built. You have to do it in pieces, and sometimes you can use those pieces to set up the politics so you can, um, you can make it easier to do the subsequent pieces. Uh, you know, it's, we certainly didn't advertise that we were doing that at the time, and, you know, it's probably one of the few places we've talked about it. But that's, you know, that's, that's a fact of, of network development. Sometimes you want to take it out a little bit in terms of not just you know what it means on the street but how you can set the network up to set yourself up for further success in the future so the other piece um, in my three ingredients of, of how to take a city you know from nowhere to somewhere with, with bike transportation was design ambition and you know, we, we, we sent some people to Copenhagen, and there actually is a little bit of this in Copenhagen. It's not the, the usual thing is to have a sidewalk and a curb and then a bike lane and a curb and then a street. But in some places, there's, there is parking along that curb. In most places, there aren't, isn't any curbside parking in, in most cities. But somewhere I saw this and said, well, we could just move it over and put signs up, and that would be that. And so they did it. And so that's our model in New York is the parking protected bike lane. Those cars are parked in, in those spaces that have been moved aside. And this, you know, we have, we have this in a bunch of different places in the city, and, and it's a good model, and it's an easy model. And your city knows how to do this, too. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, because you guys know what this looks like, and you ride in it, and you want more of it. Um, <clears throat> But it did, it did matter a lot to us in terms of the sort of numbers that we sh I showed you. I mean, yes, we were getting some people out by painting interconnected network in parts of the city, but you know, these big scary avenues in midtown, you know, people didn't want to ride on. And so it was it wasn't essential, it wasn't a huge amount of miles that we built, but it was, you know, it was a set of critical miles that really allowed more and more people to think about. Well, I can, just, I can just do a couple of tough cross-town blocks in Midtown because I can go on the 9th Avenue protected bike lane, on the 1st Avenue protected bike lane. And it tremendously contributed to the success of City Bike when it launched with the 6,000 bike system in, in 2013 because we did have Manhattan pretty much navigable on protected bike lanes by that time for a good portion of it. I mean, yeah, you know, as I said, it's still a work in progress, but there, it, there is a lot of places to ride. And so a lot of people were able to just hop on and say, yeah, I've seen these bike lanes. I've seen people using them 
I don't know why, but my wife gets cold, so they use it on the field that again. And, and they started using these bikes, and we had tens of thousands of trips from day one. And that was critical to, A, convincing people that that would be a good system that we could use, and B, starting to tamp down some of the angst in the city over cycling and bike lanes and the idea that it was just, you know, there was a sort of bifurcated critique of, well, no one's using them, and by the way, there's so many bicyclists on the street, it's really, you know, getting hectic to try to cross. Um, so it, it kind of humanized the thing, you know, reporters start riding city bikes, and celebrities were photographed riding city bikes, and politicians were riding city bikes, and it, it eased the rhetoric a little bit. So, you know, my view of, of you know, what little I know of Seattle is that, you know, you guys are in the process of really building out a transit system, and you've been doing great work with your buses and frequent bus networks, and figuring out how to speed up some of the, the most heavily used bus lines. I say if you're gonna build a transit-friendly city, you have to really double down on the pedestrian environment, and you might as well do the same with cycling, because all of those things go together. And that's, you know, it's all about the city we want to live in, is if we can live here and not have to own a car, or own just one car that we're going to use occasionally, um, that's a great city to live in, because you have choices, the choice is good. You have uh, people walking, and that's good for the city economy, it's great for retail. It's a good streetscape to be on, people, like to be near other people, what attracts people is other people, that's why busy streets are busy streets and good public spaces work. And cycling sort of puts you in the middle of all of it and allows you to move at the same time. It's kind of an interesting being in public while being, you know, while transporting yourself kind of situation. So, you know, I really think, you know, you have to be careful. You don't want to create a, a traffic cataclysm as you start to reassign space on your streets, but you, you do it gradually like everybody else has, and you eventually start to change who's in the city and how they get around and how many cars they own, and you just, you change people's transportation habits as well, as, you know, because there's not as much room to park or drive, but there's plenty of room to get around in, in other ways, and I, I think you guys are already doing that. Some of the mechanics of, you know, transit and cycling, you know, as our bike lanes, bike lane networks are getting bigger. It's, it's, you know, in some of the cases, the distances are not things that people are going to use to, to commute all the way to the central business district. So some of the focus is starting to shift to networks around transit hubs. Um, this was an early example in a, a booming neighborhood in Brooklyn where there was such chaos of parked bikes around the subway station. There actually is a subway entrance behind all those bikes. And we took a, a lane of parked cars away and wide the sidewalk and then put in hundreds of bike racks and it's still a mess um, with all the bikes. But it's you know, it's the kind of infrastructure that the city is demanding now because of the way people are, are getting around. This stop is only one one stop from Manhattan, so people are just bicycling, you know, to there and then just getting it's a great the frequency on that line is tremendous. So it's a really easy way to get to, to uh, uh, you know, an in-demand part of Manhattan, just to ride a bike a few blocks and, and, and get on the subway. And I think since you guys are building stations and you, know, you have an opportunity to really sort of build this in, this is in, in San Francisco, one of the, the BART stations in the Mission. I really like this because it's this huge array of bike racks inside the fair pavement zone. So, the, you know, you, you have less sort of, it's, it's not super public. But it's, it's, and it's very protected for the bikes that are, that are in there. Um, <clears throat> this is a state, the station at one of the terminus is at the end of one of the Boston subway lines, and uh, it's also right near one of the most heavily used bike paths in Massachusetts. So, you know, just, it just makes complete sense and saves a huge amount of uh, park and ride space and just sort of angst in terms of, you know, getting in and using transit. And, you know, we really find bike share to be part of the transit system. Um, some of the couple of the good surveys that have been done in both Washington and in New York found that around 50% of people were using bike share in connection with some other form of transportation. So they were using it, you know, like these people were using their bikes to get to the, the, the end of the, uh, the station. In, in New York, a lot of people were using it to bypass the bus connection to get straight to the subway or to, you know, bypass the slow local train to get to the express. <laughs> Um, or using it to get to ferry docks, etc. Um, and, and it's you know that sort of like just dock and leave it. Um, you know that that sort of ethos of, of using the public bikes really really works in connection with uh, 
with, with transit, and we actually find the biggest, it's the biggest and also the most heavily used uh, of the uh, city bike stations are in midtown at the commuter train stations. This is outside of Grand Central Terminal. Uh, and that's true in London too, by far the most uh, difficult to stock and difficult to find a bike station is at the, the Waterloo Rail Station in South London where pretty much everybody from South England comes to into London and then needs to get somewhere. So all of these things, these numbers that I had about the strategy for success, um, sort of paving the way for bike sharing with protected bike lanes, really helped us sort of get through some very difficult years while the press was really honest, was really questioning what the mayor and the commissioner were doing by building a bike-friendly city. Um, and, and it changed the public conversation in just a few short years. I can see these two headlines are uh, two years apart, two and a half years apart. Um, so I think, you know, it's really important to figure out when you're going to do these things, how to exact the highest ridership, how to show the greatest number of bikes on the street, and to show that kind of success that can really put your, put your critics, uh, silence your critics. Um, and the real test of this, these policies, you know, has been passed in New York because Mayor Bloomberg left office at the end of 2013 succeeded by Mayor de Blasio, who really campaigned as the anti bloomberg And probably the biggest thing he didn't change policy-wise was uh, his approach to streets. So under Mayor de Blasio, we have new protected bike lanes on Queens Boulevard, which is in tabloid speak known as the Boulevard of Death. Um, but it now looks like this. And um, the city has just retrofitted its first bridge with uh, protected bike lanes, taking uh, a traffic lane away from uh, this bridge that, that spans a channel between Brooklyn and Queens, uh, and, and devoting it to, to bikes. The bikes have been basically, you know, contesting the space to the left with pedestrians for years and years, but the volumes were increasing all the time of, of both, both, both walkers and cyclists, and it wasn't working. And the city did the right thing by, by taking the lane. And this is a project, this is just a Photoshop of it, but this is a project that will have protected lanes on a key link near one of the bridges in Manhattan. Um, and just allow people to, to do what they're already doing but in a much more comfortable and, and safe way. So um, I'll leave it at that. It's, you know, it's, it's, it, there's lots more to the story. There's, there's lots of pieces to it, but uh, that's kind of the 30-minute you know, overview of, of uh, taking cycling from zero to 100 in, in New York. Thanks. So we have a lot of time for questions. So if anybody has any questions for John, who's first? You had your hand up for like ten minutes. So I'm going to go to a different question, which is so the difference between Seattle and Denmark, New York is we've got big hills, and uh, I'm wondering about getting battery-assisted bicycles in the bike rental program. Um, it's, you know, there are cities that do that, that have uh, electric assist bike share. Um, Madrid is probably the biggest that I know of. Um, it's possible, it's more expensive, it's, it's more challenging. Like in New York, the bike share system is, it's basically got a big, couple big car batteries inside the, inside this, uh, the kiosk, and, and they're um, sort of sustained by solar power. With electric assist, you need to be able to charge the uh, bikes itself, so you probably need to wire it into the, into the street, which is a lot more expensive. So yeah, it's absolutely possible. I will say that um, San Francisco is also going in the ice hill here, and you know, bicycling is, the city is doing amazing things with bike lanes, and they're about to deploy a, a 5,000 um, bike, bike share system in the city, which on a per capita basis will put it sort of in the sort of French, Spanish, kind of Chinese league. You know, and surpass anything we've seen in the United States. Um, but it's but it's not electric assist. They, you know, they, they have pieces of their bike network to take you around the hills, and the stations and the lanes don't go up. You know, uh, up above the uh, you know the steep the steep parts. But um, I'm sure you guys have thought about those things when it comes to bike network development here. I know you. And you know, some some places do have like seven or eight speed bike share bikes, like Chattanooga, which is also kind of hilly. Time system, but they thought about that. Um, I had a question. You mentioned that 
um, part of the strategy was to first start in places where people are already heavily biking. Um, and I'm curious, in Seattle, those places that get the infrastructure and things like that are the richer neighborhoods. And we have a lot of people in the south end of Seattle that do bike a lot, but are not seen and are not counted and are not thought of. So I wonder, at what point do you go from um, you know, really focusing on places where people are already riding and you know about it because they're very vocal. And when do you actually start helping the infrastructure for people who desperately need it, probably even more than the North End, but are not getting access to it? Well, in the, in the New York case, it was, a, it was a question of establishing a policy and then making sure it would survive. So that was, the survival was the issue. So visible success was the, was the, the recipe for that. But now that, now that that is done, there are places all over the city saying, where are my city bike stations? Where are my bike lanes? Some of it's tougher. Some of it is in more residential places where there is a bigger battle to be had. But there are a lot of um, Latino neighborhoods that are, are building, getting bike networks built and demanding um, more protected bike lanes in New York. So I think. If you've gotten through stage one, then you need to do that. One of, one of the problems for New York, and it still is a problem, is that cyclists are only counted in a very small number of places. And I think to make this grow up into a real mode of transportation, you need to count in a lot more places, and you need to elaborate. And there's a lot of technologies now that are being tested. Um, I think we're going to see through NACTO and People for Bikes more emphasis on how to count cyclists so that you can Maybe it's just a matter of setting up a video camera somewhere, and you can start to just get a feed. But you, you know, if you you don't work on what you don't measure, and so you need to be measuring those things. And you know, I, I understand the, the the sort of dynamic you're talking about, and, and the city did count a few years ago in those Latino neighborhoods. The number of bikes just haphazardly parked around subway stations, and it was very very high. And so that's. That's one reason the networks are starting to focus on some of the subway stations in the further out areas where people may not ride eight or nine miles to get to some place in Manhattan, or even eight or nine miles across a, like a circumferential route in Brooklyn, but they will ride you know, 20 or 30 minutes or less to get to the train. And there is good train coverage in some of those places. So it's, it's, it's part of measurement. Where do you count? What's your regular index? And then you know, I think once there's a real policy, just to keep continue to roll these out. I mean, New York, in New York, it's it's programmatic, so you know there's going to be 30 to 50 miles of bike lanes implemented in a season. Where are they going to go? You know, it, it continues to build out, but it, you know, but also, you know, it's going into places that are demanding it, um, and it's you know, and it is easier for the city to build these where they aren't going to have a big fight. So it's it's a mix of factors. But I think once, you, once you've established that this is the program and it will survive, you absolutely have to, to, to broaden the reach. So what you just said about, uh, oh, sorry, um, about it's easier to build it where the time will be less. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I've noticed first when I see those big aerial shots of your bike plants is how wide those avenues are. Um, 80, 90, 100 feet in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. um, in Seattle, with minimal exceptions, we're looking at 40 to 55 feet on most arterials. Do you have examples of narrower channelizations where the trade-offs were a little bit clearer and the fight a little bit harder, where you still won on bike infrastructure? And or what would you suggest for people working in very narrow environments trying to prioritize bike and transit infrastructure? Um, in some cases, we turn a two-way street into one way in order to get to protect the bike lane in. Um, the model of the parking protected bike lane works really well because like, travel capacity is one thing, but parking capacity is like gold or platinum. So it's easier to take away traveling in the north than parking. Uh, so uh, often, often, just because, in, in my experience in government, is a lot of things are the way they are because no one's looked at it in a long time. And, in a lot of cases, we looked at these streets and the lanes were 13 feet wide, and the cities were going to do 10 and a half. So in some cases, we were able to do these lanes, as you said, without taking anything away, just narrowing the lanes. And that does have a good traffic calming effect. 
But there's a, there's a cross town street in Soho that has a protected pipeline and it is a different profile. It's, it's still not skinny, skinny street. In some cases, um, you know, you need to just do some kind of um, tough traffic calming so that this, the, the volume of traffic coming through is lower, then you don't need a protected bike lane. And in a lot of cases, it's, it's just a, a five foot, what, what Ashto calls a class two painted lane in a lot of those places. Um, so, but in some places, parking was completely <coughs> removed in order to just put in a, a curbside lane, with, which may not have anything but paint or maybe paint and some, some you know, floppy sticks. So it's, it is, it's, you know, it's absolutely an exercise in pragmatism and, and how to do it. Um, and, you know, we, we got into some really pitch battles. It wasn't, it wasn't all the easy streets, but, uh, but um, you know, the infrastructure's still there. And it's heavily used, so that, you know, the constituency for it gets stronger all the time. And so it's very hard for anybody to have to pay attention to the way it wants it to. Uh, do you have problems with, I mean, do some of the protected bike lanes I ride around here, uh, I, I tend to ride kind of fast sometimes, do you have problems with uh, pedestrians getting nailed and like going going out to a bus island, for instance, without looking at the, looking for a bicyclist on the bike lane? We have places, um, we tend to put the buses on the other side of the street from the bike lanes, the bike lanes that we go to the left side of one-way streets and the buses on the right. So we don't have the floating bus lane problem. We have parts of Midtown where the sidewalk capacity is, is, is so constrained that people just walk in unprotected bike lanes. So then you just kind of have to make your presence known as a cyclist. Um, but you, you, know, you need to do it so your presence is known and you don't have people. Um, we actually have probably fewer bike pedestrian conflicts now because people were out on the sidewalk when the streets were too scary. And so now it's much easier to simply stay in the street and, and, and do that. And that's documented along a bunch of those corridors that sidewalk cycling has, has reduced, been reduced dramatically. But you know, look, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're go, you know, going over 20 miles an hour, you might just want to mix it up with traffic. Um, you know, one thing people learn when more and more people rise, there's, you know, there's trade-offs there too. You have to, uh, you know, you have to pass other cyclists, you have to accommodate slower cyclists. And my question is based sort of on once having stupidly ridden up Third Avenue and... Uh, in New York? Yeah, in New York. And uh, I came away with a sense that New York was far safer to ride, even where there weren't bike lanes, than in Seattle. So are there statistics about um, a reduction in injuries to bicycles because the, the, the network is kind of tight. You know, I wanted to go to 96th Street. I didn't want to go to Chinatown. So, uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah the num those, those, are the, those are the numbers every, every city collects, so they're the easiest to track. Um, there was, a, there was a, um, an injury line on the chart I showed, and it was basically flat despite huge increases in cycling. So the, the rate of you know, crashes and, and injuries per cycle trip taken or mile mile ridden has plummeted, has plunged dramatically. Um, and the city, the city last year hit an all-time low in traffic fatalities for any recorded year when the record started in 1910. Um, and it looks like we're track so far in the first half of the year to, to beat that further. So I think, you know, you want a city that's rebuilding the streets for multiplicity of purposes. If you want to be a safe city, you don't make it a, a you know a driving monocle. Thanks for your uh, coming here and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, question: um, I'm concerned about climate change, and I'm curious if uh, you've been able to correlate any of these activities with actual reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, and/or uh, corollary question would be. Have you noticed any displacing of the supremacy of cars in, in any of this work? Well, definitely the supremacy of cars is being displaced. Um, not city-wide, but in, these, in, in the areas where we're able to do this work. We're, we're reassigning street space on an ongoing basis from cars to buses, uh, public space, and the cycling network. This place where the city bike station is on the right used to have cars going through it. Um, and Upstream of where where the photographer is standing, I think on a statue, probably. Um, 
there's a complete interruption of Broadway with, uh, with a public space outside of uh, Macy's and Herald Square, where it was just, we simply pedestrianized it. So Broadway is kind of a local access street now, not a through, through thoroughfare. Um, the city has a sustainability office that does keep track of, uh, of municipal greenhouse gas emissions. I haven't looked at that in a while, so I don't, I don't fully know the answer. I think, I think and, and the city bike system also does a monthly report on carbon emissions saved. But I think it's kind of a long game in this case. A lot of the people who are cycling now are probably coming out of subways or buses. On the other hand, subway ridership is at an all-time high. Bus ridership is declining somewhat. Um, but I think as you build a city where you don't need to own a car, you have a tremendous impact on climate change. And when the mayor re released the, the city's first sustainability plan in 2007, I thought one of the most fascinating parts of the climate analysis was there was this huge delta in what they call avoided sprawl. And they're looking at the city's demographic trend. And it was, well, we can, we can work on our systems to make the city work better for a city of 9 million instead of 8 million, which, which we had at the time. And that means those people aren't in towns in Pennsylvania or Texas or wherever where they're driving everywhere. We're attracting them to New York where it's completely efficient to live, we live in small apartments. We generally don't own cars, we have good transit. And so, you know, that's, I mean, my, uh, my friend Jeanette goes around the world saying, look, if you want to save the planet, move to New York, or move to downtown Seattle, because that's where you're having a much lower impact, because you can take the bus, you can walk, you can ride a bike. So as you build a livable city that attracts more people, you're absolutely having a big climate impact, certainly in the United States. What's from your graph that you had continual progress, and I'm wondering how you maintain that momentum even through election You mean with the construction of the bike lanes? Yeah, like controversial projects for well, election years. Some of, it, some of it is just the cycle of how, how government works. So the basic way these kinds of quick street projects happen in New York is um, the traffic division will basically sit down and plan out a bunch of them in the fall and the winter, and then all those guys turn into project managers in the, um, in the spring and summer. And so there's an annual cycle to it. So when Mayor de Blasio was elected and took office in, on New Year's Day of 2014, there's already a ton of projects in the hopper ready to go. And you know, there's a, in agencies that big, there's a, there's a degree of autopilot. So, um, you know, there was, there was some sense that you don't want to go out and pick a giant bike lane fight two months into the mayor's term. But there were projects in hand that could be implemented and, and were during 2014, and some, some quite good ones, including a couple of um, conversions of class two bike lanes into protective bike lanes in, in parts of lower Manhattan that year. So there's always an art to it. I mean, when you're, when you're running a big city agency, part of, your, uh, part of your brief is keeping City Hall off your neck. And so that's, you know, that's always baked into the process. But if you have ambitious leaders who also want to see things done, they're also managing up all the time. And if any of you guys have read Jeanette's book, I don't think she really tells the story of doing this from the middle. She wasn't the mayor. She was the transportation commissioner. She wasn't even the deputy mayor. But she was managing up all the time and creating space for us to do these things. So yes, you kept building the white lanes. There, there was some rhythm to it here and there. But, um, and yeah, nobody wanted to pick a big fight with anybody in the, in the, the very beginning, but um, Mayor de Blasio overruled the local uh, community planning board to put those bike lanes in and take uh, Queens Boulevard last year and another section this year. So, you know, he, he, he's, people have managed up and, and he gets what it's about. What was a business reaction to some of the bike lane conversions to protected bike lanes, like retail, that kind of thing? It was always a conversation sort of at the storefront level. Um, the good thing about rearranging the streets is that, and it, it, you never have enough loading zones in Manhattan, it's just a fact. But you could, it gave, it gave an opportunity for those guys to be heard, and there, there was a, a level of retail politics that went on, so that you didn't want to build these things without talking to, to folks. And, the, the floating parking lane can be organized to create lo loading zones, and in some cases, the loading zones are wrapped around the corners of, of, from the avenues onto 
res you know residential cross town streets just because you needed more space. And so so there was some loss, some additional loss of just you know regular old parking spaces in order to accommodate that. But again, you know one of the reasons places in Europe are what they are is because every year they take a few percentage of the parking away, and that, that has an impact over over a long term. Hi, thanks for coming to Seattle. I've ridden around New York for the last couple of years, and I'll tell you that the system's really amazing. I've actually felt safer riding in New York than I do riding here. It looks from your presentation, I've got a two-part question, that a lot of your facilities are one-way protected bicycle facilities. Do you build a lot of two-way facilities? Yeah. And also, oh, wait, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a tremendous percentage of one-way streets in, in New York. The, um, the street designers are getting more comfortable with two-way, but they weren't initially. And, and, and on high, very high volume streets, the signals are also phased in a way that would work heavily against people riding contra flow. So we, 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 we did create some uh, two-way facilities, kind of where there was a hard edge, like along a park where there weren't cross streets crossing the two-way, or along a waterfront where there weren't a lot of cross streets crossing the two-way. You know, with traffic, simplicity is safety. So if you create a complicated, a more, if, you're, if you're introducing complexity with two-way bike traffic in, a, in, a, in an already busy intersection, you know, it can be difficult. So that was where the, the most comfort was with two-way. It was along some kind of edge where, the, where there wasn't a high volume of crossing traffic. It's starting to change a little bit. Um, we've seen more two-way, but not again, not on big one-way avenues yet. And Although I would say like in Chicago or Washington, like in the Chicago Loop, we can find some great two-way protected land, so not, not dissimilar to the Second Avenue lane here. And what do you guys do about freight corridors? Do you put bike facilities through freight corridors? Yeah, I mean, freight is pretty is a pretty bad situation in New York because the um, a lot of the parkways and things that were built sort of pre-war and just immediately post-war were parkways, so they don't they weren't built to accommodate trucks. So we actually have limited access highways with no trucks and city avenues with all the trucks. Um, but yeah, like First Avenue, Second Avenue of Manhattan are the major truck routes of the of the East Side, and they have protected bike lanes, and that's good. Any other questions? So two questions. Back to the narrow roads. Um, we've got some streets where we need to put two transit lanes in, and there's also demand for a cycle track. And there's no real possibility of a parallel street because there's like elevation barriers or something on both sides. So, wondering if you have any thoughts about that situation. Um, you can't fit both the transit and the bike lanes, but you need both. And second, I see everyone has a helmet. I'm wondering, does New York have a helmet law? Because we have a county helmet law, and there's a question of how much is that possibly depressing ridership or willingness to bike share? Um. I don't know the great answer on the narrow corridor that also must have bus lanes. I mean, it's, you know, maybe you, uh, we don't do shared bus and bike lanes in New York. It's just, the, 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 we don't, we just, we find it in, in our sort of context, it doesn't work very well. It, it slows down the buses, it's intimidating for the cyclists. Um, so I don't know what you do. I think you have to just sort of figure out what your priorities are there and, and figure out another way around for the, you know, whoever can't fit. Maybe it's private cars that need to be taken out for that car. Or not. You know, I, I don't know the situation. Um, New York doesn't have a whole lot. I would estimate that only 25 to 30% of cyclists use them. Um, so, and, you know, occasionally there's a call for I want to buy from somebody who doesn't know anything about bike transportation, and um, it's fought, it's it's wrestled down very quickly and fought to the death. And um, I don't see it happening in New York, and I think it, we wouldn't have been able to do city bike, uh, and we wouldn't see anywhere near the kind of usage that we do in terms of cycling as a rule. I think, you know, to the extent that you know that, that you have this law and it's enforced and is a factor. Um, you, need to, you need to get rid of it. You need to, you need to eliminate it. Cycling groups shouldn't be complicit in it by being quiet about it. And I know it's difficult because it's a county thing rather than a city thing, but it's a problem. I mean, places like Tel Aviv and Mexico City explicitly got rid of their helmet laws in order to launch bike share systems because they knew the two didn't go together. Some of the worst dogs of bike share systems in the world are in Australia where they don't have helmet laws and the usage is 
very low in places like Brisbane and Melbourne. Um, and, you know, again, our safety record, the safety records of places where, where you really have mass cycling. Um, safety record in London where cycling is like blowing through the roof even though the streets aren't all that great. Um, shows that it's not about helmets, it's about um, creating a, a space of, and a visibility of cycling and a, and a, a you know, a critical mass of cyclists on the street so that, you know, other users of the street get habituated to it. Otherwise, you're going to have a sort of small group of self-identified cyclists instead of just people on bikes as your, you know, as your sort of cycling cohort. You mentioned installing 30 to 50 miles of infrastructure a year mm -hmm. in a place like New York that can be extremely expensive. So I'm wondering uh, what your funding mechanism is and how that's been maintained over time. It's not that expensive because a lot of it is just painting even with the protective bike lanes. It's just, it's just a matter of changing the regulation and moving the cars off the curb. You know, there, you know it's, not, it's not nothing. And there is some signalization and in some cases putting concrete islands to set the bike lanes off at the intersections. But a lot of it is the personnel who do the planning and the outreach. And a lot of that is funded through federal um, congestion mitigation and quality funds. But a lot of it is city funds. Well, and the Mayor's Sustainability Initiative in 2007 made additional city funds available for that. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, in transportation terms, it's dirt cheap in terms of building, buying buses, building streets, uh, even you know, even repainting the streets. And you can, you can, you know, you can do some some good stuff, you know, when when you're going to resurface a thousand million miles of streets a year. You don't have to remarket the same way. You know you're going to market, and so some of it just comes out of the markings of the signal budget already, repurposing some of that that you know existing regular operating resource. It's a, it's really a matter of building it into the program so that it doesn't become an extraordinary expense. There isn't some bike lane budget hanging out there that people can target, um, and you know we we were at a point where we had the, the head of the traffic bureau, the deputy commissioner, the assistant commissioner. And you know, a big, big office full of people. Not to mention a bunch of people in the commissioner's office who are all cyclists, um, sort of running, you know, this institution. But but the programmatic side of it is building these things into the traffic program so that it's not extraordinary to do bus lanes and bike lanes each year, it's, and you don't need to seek <coughs> external funding. The funding also doesn't come per project. It's the project is bike lane, bike network development, and it's a multi-year thing that we work out with the state. So that it's you know there isn't a big you know outcry over federal funding for the bike lane on Fifth Avenue. It's just there's regular funding each year for bike network development, and that's another part of that sort of network thinking that I think has to has to be part of this. We're going to take two more questions. So I think we have one here, and anyone else, or just one more. I had a second question. Um, so ever since Seattle has started installing two-way cycle tracks, I, as a year-round bike commuter, have noticed a dramatic increase in cyclists using one-way bike lanes as two-way cycle tracks. So I'm curious because I do see this at least three times a week, if not more. Um, when you are adding all these bike lanes and things in New York, are, is there any kind of educational campaign, any kind of signage? or anything you do to let cyclists know what it is that's being put in place and that it's not just uh, everything's two-way now? A lot of the outreach is to, um, to businesses that use bikes for delivery. And they, they often have a lot of folks who are new to the city and new to the country and a lot of non-English speakers. And so this, the DOT does have a program to go out specifically to talk to, to restaurant and other delivery kind of businesses and to get the materials to people in Chinese and Spanish and other languages. And it actually furnishes helmets to some of those businesses just so that, and, and vests and other, other things. So a lot of it is, is that. But look, if it's scary to ride on the street and there's a big protective bike lane sitting next to it, it's not completely unreasonable that people are doing that. So this lane, this guy is coming down Broadway. I've counted a couple times, probably a third of the bike traffic on that protected bike lane is contraflow, and it's you know supposed to be one way downtown. It's a pretty wide bike lane, so the city should probably just at some point make it two way and suck it up. But 
you know, it's not, you know, it's not a fully built out system that's made for everyone to get around by bike who wants to get around by bike to every destination they want to get to. So you're going to have, you know, some sketchiness in there. And, you know, just a little bit of time I walked around here, I saw plenty of people riding bikes on sidewalks because they weren't going to go on Fifth Avenue at 4, 4 in the afternoon. I'm wondering, this is something that we deal with here, that we're dealing with here right now, during the build-out of the bike network, how much wavering of political or administrative leadership was there in terms of the will to complete the network, and that, how did that impact the success of building the network out? Well, the network is definitely not complete, um, but the, in terms of the willpower to continue building it, um, it was pretty resolute. I mean, it was, I would say, a pretty extraordinary time to have somebody like Mayor Bloomberg um, you know, in office, because he, he wasn't somebody who put up with a lot of nonsense or, or cared about it, criticism if he didn't feel it was founded. So, you know, I, I saw him in the press conference just, just take these kinds of questions and be like, look, I've asked the same questions of the department, and I have the numbers. It's safer and more people are riding bikes, and that's our policy. So it was completely unwavering in that regard. And then some of the, you know, some of the tabloids really thought they could actually get you know, take Jeanette out of her job at one point, and um, you know, the mayor stood up and said, "Look, if, if you uh, if you know if you want me to get rid of somebody, uh, you know, the the worst thing to do is to say that that's what you want because I'm not going to do it." And, and you know, we had City Hall really pushing back and just you know issuing fact sheets and saying, "Look, the stuff that's in the newspapers is is just made up." So it was it was very very resolute. Um, but I would say, you know, Mary de Blasio is not quite like that, but the program, again, has not wavered. I mean, they've, they've taken, they've gotten into some real sort of morasses in terms of some community fights, partly because they're in some tougher residential areas, but, you know, the program is still continuous, and there's still, you know, the good news is there's a lot of demand for it now, too. And in a big city, you can work with the people you want to work with, you know, you don't want to go necessarily building protected bike lanes all over Staten Island when you have other neighborhoods saying, where's my city bike? So you can pick your battles, but um, we've had really, really good leadership. And it's an essential, essential foundation for something like this. Great. Thanks so much, Sean, for uh, your time tonight. We really appreciate it. And thank you guys for coming. Today, this afternoon, um